I think this was placed in the primary care slash urology for both of us to get together and try to come up with a better path forward. But we know that as urologists, when we think about prostate cancer and prostate cancer screening, it's sort of a no-brainer. Why wouldn't you want to know early? Why wouldn't we want to find out and offer options for men at an earlier stage than finding out too late, as we often see? And so we think about things like Pat Walsh's advice or maybe Bell Carter's book. But there is a, a contingency out there that sort of opposes us. It's larger than urology, and there are books like The Invasion of the Prostate Snatcher out there, things like that. So it's not all warm and fuzzy when we get outside our comfort zone of our urology meetings and our urology brethren. So I want to provide us with a little bit of an update on some prostate cancer facts, talk a little bit about the screening studies that we know, um, some of the controversy around the 2012 changes and then what happened thereafter, and then talk a little bit about the latest um, AUA recommendations too. But we, I, I just want us to realize that we're against, um, uh, is an upward battle for us. We're, we're certainly not in the majority and we have plenty of messaging and work to do uh, before we can get consensus on this. Um, we know that prostate cancer is the number one male cancer. The rates are declining, but there's over 161,000 new cases and 26,000 deaths. We're proud to say that we're not the number two leading cause of death anymore. We're moving down, and that's important. Lung and colon cancer are more of a lethal threat to men these days. Um, this is the classic graph that we know happened in when PSA became available, and we saw widespread use of PSA, and it led to the detection of not only incident but prevalent cases, and it peaked, and then it's been declining. Um, nevertheless, uh, the decline has accelerated in lieu of some of these um, policy statements that have been sort of against screening. Good news on the natural experiment of the United States, there's been a decline in the mortality of men with prostate cancer, as I mentioned earlier, somewhere around 3% per year annually over the last five to seven years. So in the natural experiment, we're saving lives and something's working to our advantage, even if we can't get the policy statements and the high level evidence to convincingly prove it. We know that PSA surrounds this controversy. So later today, you're gonna to hear about smarter PSA, better ways to use PSA, things like that. But certainly, uh, PSA was revolutionary in our ability, and anyone who treats a tumor would love to have a marker like PSA to help in its management. It's just that it has to be managed and has to be used appropriately. The two main randomized clinical trials that are out there that people often look at when they try to justify screening are the PLCO, which was the U.S. study. Dr. Crawford was a major investigator in that. It was really, the problem was though that, uh, you know, doing a randomized study in the United States where you convince men that it's important to do this PSA testing, and on the other hand, you're not gonna do testing or you're gonna do sort of usual care, created a problem, and PSA was already being used like wildfire in the United States. In Europe, they had a little bit of an advantage because they weren't doing widespread PSA testing, and so, um, the European study had a little less contamination, as you'll see, um, but it also had its own problems because it wasn't just a single study, it was multiple studies from different countries, and so they had kind of a combination, more of a meta-analysis approach to, to the screening. This was the biggest problem we faced. This was a 2012 um, U.S. Task Force policy statement that came out against prostate cancer screening. So they'd had an earlier version that was sort of against older men um, over the age of 75, and I think that was around 2010, but this one was against screening in general. So that grade D recommendation hit squarely, and then that subsequently resulted in a decline. Some good news, less older men, as shown in the yellow bar there, were tested, so men over the age of 75, but also suddenly younger men were not being tested either, and so that decline had consequences too, which we'll show. But getting back to the reality we know and believe is that death rates from prostate cancer were declining, and we have better therapies for some more advanced 
there, and we'll talk about the advanced therapies, I think, towards uh, Sunday, but they're not curing the cancer. So the best way to cure these patients was to actually detect a early, potentially aggressive cancer and treat it, and then uh, you'd have a win. So we have to look at these screening trials with a grain of salt and talk about how that gets managed in, in routine clinical care. So we'll just briefly look at those. Um, this was the PLCO study. It had about 70, almost 77,000 men in it. Um, the men were divided up into uh, screening, which was annual screening, um, compared to sort of usual care. Um, and that went on for uh, several years. I think it was up to six years, the randomization and the, and the screening took place. Um, not all men had a biopsy. I think they used a threshold of around four to trigger a biopsy. Um, and so the story went. We know that we found more cancers in the men who were screened. And so the PSA uh, was good at detecting cancers when men went undergo biopsy versus the community standard. But what we found was that there wasn't any long-term uh, data to clearly show that we were reducing deaths the way the trial was originally designed. So that was a problem, and when the U.S. Preventive Task Force Services looked at that data, that was kind of leading to their conclusions. Now, the criticisms of this are many, but um, the usual care definition was a moving target and changing, and that led to as many as uh, 80, 90 percent of men in the usual care or control arm uh, going out and getting a PSA test, which then was, the study was never powered really to be able to determine differences if, if everybody was going to go out and do that. And there were other issues along the way. But I think the biggest problem is the contamination issue that was never really well thought out when they, when they had the trial design. The European study was also um, a, was a little bit larger study. We had about 77,000 men in the U.S. study, 180,000 men in this one. Um, the majority of these men were not screened every year, but there was some that were screened every other year, but generally it was every four years. Um, the, similarly, they had biopsy thresholds for PSA, um, and they had less contamination due to the fact that, at least in Europe, there wasn't that community standard to PSA screen everybody. The good news about this study was that it did show a significant reduction in death from prostate cancer. So it was about a 21% in that, but after adjusting out for some contamination, et cetera, it could be as high as a 30% relative risk reduction. And in some statistical ways, they found that you probably need to screen somewhere around 37 men to to detect a cancer and save, save that man potentially. So the, there are criticisms of this as well because like I said, there were different uh, countries involved in the studies. Um, they may not have had enough follow-up to really see the true benefit, uh, but nevertheless, this one wasn't our problem. Our problem was really the PLCO study. There, there was um, another European study that was included, I think, in it, the Swedish study, the Gothenburg study. Um, it had 20,000 men, but the reason that it was an important sort of subset study, if you will, is that it looked at younger men, which is the men we're trying to target. The average age was around 56 years, um, and it was the youngest of those trials that I've, I've touted so far. And they showed somewhere in the range of about a 44% risk reduction in deaths from prostate cancer, um, and only needed to, to screen, say, 12 men to, to really come up with this type of a value. So. Um, that's an important thing that was kind of ignored by the U.S. Preventive Task Force Services. So um, if you looked at it in summary, you could say that while there's these screening trials out there, um, I think they focus pretty heavily on the PLCO results instead of really on the European study. Why they sided with one versus the other, I don't know. Um, but I think that it could be made a good argument. There, there, I didn't have time to update it, but there's a new um, paper that I, I think David Crawford was on in the Annals of Internal Medicine the, in October, uh, which uh, took, I think, the individual data from the European study and the PLCO study, took the raw data and statistically kind of corrected for the, the screening intensity, and even using all the data together, you can make a good argument that somewhere in that 20 to 30 percent range risk reduction for prostate cancer. So if we believe this, and as urologists we need to get this message out, we got a problem because, you know, in, in the South maybe, where I was at Vanderbilt in the Southeast, we, we would say we have a failure to communicate. We're not doing a good job of teaching our 
primary care brethren that the value is there and that we know how to manage these people and perhaps thoughtfully detect their cancers and manage them once we've discovered it. So some of the origin is a failure to underappreciate the benefit that we're saving lives and that some of these men that we detect will have aggressive cancers and we have a certainly treatment, effective treatment to help them. Another one is an overestimation of the harms. So one of the things that was sort of the thought process with the panel was every man that we diagnose is going to get a radical treatment of some sort. Um, this is uh, underestimating the value of reassurance as well. And this was a study in JAMA where they did some decision analysis and looked at, you know, what, what would you rather be? And so the A group was the, I don't know, I didn't do a PSA and I, I don't know my value, but I, I think I don't have cancer. That wasn't very comforting to those men. Um, Bs were people that had, um, you know, the uh, no cancer and a normal PSA, so they're reassured. And then the Cs were the people who had to go through the screening, but then turned out not to have cancer, so they were happy that they didn't have the cancer. And if you look, not all, you know, it was clear that at least in this group, men sort of valued the idea of knowing that they weren't sitting on a time bomb, didn't have cancer. So this gets back to the overestimation of harm. So in the data that they collected, they made estimations based on kind of Medicare data for radical prostatectomy, um, especially in the open air and historical data. So the rates of complications were higher. But I think even just uncoupling treatment from the, from the diagnosis is really the most important thing. And this is just a, shows that you know, many men that we diagnose today who have lower risk cancer and David's going to talk later about some of the genomic tools that we use in addition to the clinical tools. And we are all endorsing active surveillance and active monitoring for these men. So it's not a given that they go on to receive uh, radical treatments and have complications, as those books would suggest. And then even in some men who we do want treatment or who find active surveillance unacceptable but have lower risk cancers, we're applying more local treatments, focal treatments, whether that's cryo, HIFU, some newer technologies are emerging, so we're learning to do the male equivalent of a lumpectomy in the right setting and imaging and all these things have added up to better ways for us to assess their cancers. Nevertheless, that preventive task force services did their recommendation and that had consequences. So what were the consequences of that? One was that there was less screening going on by primary care. We already know that the primary care do most of the initial PSA testing, and this showed that not only were they not doing PSA testing or screening in, in older men, which may be acceptable, but in the younger men, they were also being left out. This was another um, study that looked at sort of a national survey, um, and it found that not only it looked at PSA testing and DRE testing after that 2012 uh, mandate and found that both the rectal exam way down and the PSAs were way down as well. So again, it gets back to the implications of this in the common primary care world where most of the battles being fought. This also showed that that recommendation, if we're not doing the PSA testing, naturally we're not going to have as many patients come forward uh, to undergo evaluation and biopsy, and that was borne out in this, um, retros this review of the, of the Medicare database. And then finally, although it's a short snapshot, there was a reduction in the detection of prostate cancer by about 30 percent, but if you said, well, they just missed a few low-grade cancers, that would be fine. But there were also a significant reduction up in about somewhere in the 25 to 28 percent range for high-grade cancers, the ones that we can treat early before they metastasize and often can change the natural history. So that was concerning. So there have been some other people, uh, smarter mathematical, statistical models that said, you know, if this were to continue, uh, we would see significant increase in the presentation of metastatic disease, and that would, of course, have consequences in terms of increasing death rates, again, from prostate cancer. So there were significant com uh, confounders and, and consequences of the U.S. Preventive Task Force recommendations that we know. Meanwhile, the AUA was trying to message uh, urologists to do a better job with their own screening, and so I'll just briefly say that the AUA panel, when they met, said, okay, we're not going to screen 
with uh, in men that are younger, so under the age of 40, uh, that's not going to happen. We can argue about that, you know, as a baseline one-time test, but at least in terms of mass screening, they came out in, against it. And similarly, they came out against it in younger men, men defined as between 40 and 54, because those clinical trials really weren't designed um, to high-level evidence prove that the screening was beneficial in those men. Where they did come down on that shared decision-making and screening was in that sweet spot where the studies were conducted somewhere between the ages of 55 and 69, where they did say that's where appropriate for screening in a, in a you know, a shared decision-making model. And then they also said it doesn't have to be every year, could be every two years, um, and that would be a little more thoughtful, a little more cost-effective, and, and probably add to uh, the consensus about it, and then not to screen older men. Again, I have problems personally with some of these just hardline statements, but life expectancy and their physiologic age, I think, is far more important than their chronologic age. But at least the point is that the AUA was thinking about trying to send the right message to urologists to not overdo it, and I think everybody kind of got that point. Others, such as the American College of, Phys of Physicians, have also sort of followed in line more towards a targeted age-specific um, recommendation, um, looking at the life expectancy and other comorbidities as key factors before we just do the mass screening that we used to do. And then, lo and behold, the things are changing. The U.S. Preventive Task Force Services did soften their recommendation and now have given, it doesn't sound that good of a grade. When my kids bring home a C, I'm not that happy. Um, so they gave it a grade C. It's so for 59 to 69 men, uh, age uh, men, they believe that it is okay to do shared decision making, still hold that D grade for the men above the age of 70. But things did change a little bit. But so I, I, I think I've, I've tried to highlight to you that um, we've got to do a better job when we um, communicate to our peers. We have to do a better job of counseling our patients when we see them, and we have to do a more thoughtful job if we do undergo uh, prostate screening and biopsy of managing men so that we're not held to the standard that we're harming these men just to find cancer and treat appropriately um, the high-grade cancers and manage more thoughtfully the more um, indolent uh, low-grade cancers.